Hi, thanks for watching the sermon on YouTube. We'd like to invite you to come to church, though. We meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. at Cross Point Community Church. And may God bless you. I grew up in a Baptist church, and um, as I'd go through the different Sunday school classes on almost every classroom that I would go in, they had this picture. In fact, I remember in grade school, this picture was in some of the, the grade school that I went to. That, that's shocking. Uh, you're saying, I did not know he was that old. I didn't know they had pictures like that in the 1800s, but nevertheless, I was there, and uh, I always wondered about what that picture meant. And so I asked one of my Sunday school teachers, I mean, I said, well, did Jesus get locked out? He says, no, he's knocking on the door of your heart, you know, wanting to come in and save you and be a Christian. Well, that passage, I mean, that picture was beguiling to me. It always bothered me. It bothered me for a number of reasons. Number one, I'm looking at Jesus' face. And as I looked at his face there, there was some degree of apprehension, as if he's saying, um... I wonder if anybody's home. I was also looking at the fact that Jesus was knocking. I, and I'm thinking, can't Jesus go wherever he wants to go? But he's knocking, and when you knock on a door, you're not storming into a house. You're asking permission to come in. And then I noticed also that he's got one foot on the step and one foot is down as if maybe he's thinking that someone's going to open the door and he will come in and uh, be in this house. But as beguiling and as troubling as that picture was to me as a child, the passage is even more troubling. And that is the fact that this picture is taken from the passage that we're going to study today, uh, where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and he with me, and I will dine with him and he with me. Now, I do recall that when I was on Campus Crusade for Christ staff and I was first learning to share my faith, this was the verse that we would use in the four spiritual laws if someone wanted to become a Christian. They would ask Jesus into his heart. As a child, that bothered me. Is, is Jesus going to shrink? I mean, how does he get into my heart? That's, in fact, I thought that was a little creepy if you want to know the truth of it. So I remember the first time I ever shared my faith with someone, I was trying to be bold and not use the four spiritual laws, but I said, here's my Bible, why don't you read this? And I said, turn with you, and this was a guy, we walked in his room, and I, this was a long time ago, this was in the 70s, and his whole room was pastored with dirty pictures of women, so I'm trying to stay down here, not being distractive, and I said, you know, you know Jesus has a word for you, sir. And I said, you can read that. Here, you can read it in my Bible. It's in Revelation 2.20. And uh, he starts reading it. And it says, behold, I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. I said, uh, try, try 3.20. See that, you know. So I got him to 3.20. He started reading that. And uh, he actually ended up accepting Jesus Christ as his Savior. So that was the last time I used Revelation 3.20 in evangelism because I didn't want to mess it up with the other one. But we were at Laodicea. It's an absolutely amazing site. I showed you myself preaching there. These are some of the columns of the, uh, the city that are going out. It was kind of an overcast day. It was a foreboding day. And there was just something, something unsettling about being in Laodicea, knowing what it was like within Scripture. Now, those of you all, I'll remind you, it's been several weeks we've done this, that when Paul writes to these seven churches, he uses a form letter. A letter much like you might use if you were applying for a job. You just type something different in it. It's a form letter. And there's five sections to the form letter for most of the churches. Not every church uses this form letter. In fact, most of them, uh, while uh, two of them don't use this, this one is different because whereas normally talks about some characteristic of himself, he commends the church, he criticizes the church, he gives them a command and a commitment. In this one, there is no Con, uh, commendation for the church. The church of Laodicea is one of those churches that he cannot say anything good about. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be that type of church, or I don't want to be that type of Christian. But he cannot say anything good about that church. Now, just so you remember where we are is this whole area, and that's where we were. That's, you know, Asia Minor, and there's... um, that's the cities that we, some of the cities that we were in. But Paul began this epistle on Patmos. We spent two nights there, I think, maybe, yeah, two nights there. It's an amazing, and those from there, the letter goes out to seven different churches in Asia Minor. The last one that he writes to is Laodicea, and that's where we were. It's an amazing ruin that we went to in Laodicea, and we saw it. Now, let's look at Laodicea, and what made it unique is this. It was one of the wealthiest cities ever. In fact, they suffered an earthquake, and normally Rome itself would send money to rebuild the city. But they didn't have any need for Rome. They raised all of the money from their own citizens to rebuild their entire city following this earthquake. They were amazed. It's the only city that did that that says, no, we'll take care of ourselves. We don't need Rome's money. The other thing that you notice about that, and one of the reasons this was such a wealthy city, because it had a huge banking sector, a financial sector. It was on a main trade route, and as people would come through, going all the way down to the sea, they would exchange coins, they would do their banking there, they would sell goods. It had a huge financial sector, and it was very, very wealthy. Second thing you know about, it had a huge health care se- sector there. There was a hospital there, and they were known for what is known as Phrygian salve. They were little tablets that you'd mix with water, and you'd put them in your eyes, and it was an ointment for the eyes. They made tons of money, and people came from all over the world to be here. But they also had a garment district or a garment sector there. All throughout this area on the hills that you would see, they had these luxuriously black sheep with this glossy black coat. And they would weave coats, they would weave outer garments there, and everybody wanted these because it was kind of like wearing a, um, a tuxedo. It was very dressy, very elegant, and there was a huge garment sector there. And that's because they had these sheep all over the place. Now, let's get into what's important here, and that is Jesus Christ. Notice what he says in verse 14. There are three characteristics of Jesus Christ. And it's important that you know in each one of these letters, he gives some characteristics of who he is. Now, why is that important? Because until you understand correctly who Jesus is, you'll never know what he can do. He's telling you who he is. And when you get these things through your mind and you understand these things, you'll know more about the resources that are available to you. There are three things that he says about himself here. He says, number one, he is the amen. Number two, the faithful and true witness. And number three, the beginning of creation. Three things that he says about himself. Number one, he is immutable. He doesn't change. This word for amen, if you will, is the same word that's used in the Old Testament. It means truth. Uh, it's, that's kind of a, a transliteration of the Hebrew word. Amen is a transliteration of the Hebrew word that sounds very similar to that. And so what he's saying first off is about Jesus Christ. Is he is immutable, unchanging. He is the embodiment of truth. In fact, it says in Isaiah 65, 16, speaking of God, of which Jesus is, he who is blessed on the earth will be blessed by the God of truth. Of course, Jesus himself makes the claim that I am the way and the truth and the life. He makes a claim to represent spiritual reality. You see, that's what truth is. Truth, by definition, is that which corresponds to reality. And Jesus is saying that when it comes to spiritual reality, I am the revealer of that. He goes on to say, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. So not only is Jesus Christ the truth, but every word in the Old Testament, every word that Jesus speaks in the New Testament, as well as every word in the New Testament, represents spiritual reality. 
Now that's important to know that. And the reason, reason that's important to know is that you can know what's true. We live in a day and age where we oftentimes, and I've come to believe this here, the, the term fake news. It's not true. They make stuff up. And we're in a generation that a large majority gets their information from the internet, the World Wide Web. Of course, we know that's always true, and you would never get any false things on there. Even though there's aliens living in, um, in Montana right now, they landed three years ago in a spaceship. I saw pictures on the internet of that. But Jesus is saying that everything about me is true. Immutable means unchanging, never changes. Second thing that he says about himself in that passage is he is a revealer. He reveals something. Not only is he the truth, the inculcation of truth, but he reveals truth to people. He says right there that he is, and again, it, uh, the first portion is almost the Hebrew version of that. The second is the Greek version. There were as a large Jewish population in Laodicea. So maybe John is kind of trying to get the Greeks to understand who he is, as well as to get the Jews to understand who he is. He says two things. He is the faithful and true witness. You see, the first thing talks about who he is. The second thing talks about what he does. He reveals. He is a revealer. He's a faithful and true witness. R.C. Trench spoke of what is required of a witness. And he says there are three things that are required of a witness. Number one, they must have seen with their own eyes what they report on. That's the first thing that you need of a faithful and good witness. They must have seen with their eyes what they report on. In other words, it's not hearsay information. Second thing that a, uh, a, a good witness is, is they must be absolutely honest. Remember, Jesus is the amen. He cannot tell a truth. God is not a man that he should lie. They must be absolutely honest so that what they repeat with accuracy, what they have seen and heard, they must be able to accurately communicate what they've seen and heard. The third thing is they must have the ability to communicate what they have to say so that their testimony may make its true impression on those who hear. Now I don't think there's any doubt that Jesus Christ fulfills all portions of this. He is the truth of God. He is the secondly the revealer of God. That's what he does. He reveals God. But the third thing that we see about Jesus Christ is he is not only a truther, not only is he a revealer, and that and what he said about that is I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. Jesus Christ is a witness of his own self, and so is the Father. He is also a designer. Notice what it says, the third component of that. It says, I am the, what does he say? He says, I am the beginning of the creation. That didn't mean that Jesus Christ is a created being. No, Jesus Christ is what in philosophy we call a non-contingent being. By a non-contingent being, I simply mean someone that doesn't have a beginning, doesn't have an end, and doesn't have to be maintained. I am speaking to a room full of contingent beings. You had a, be a, a beginning, you'll have a demise when you die, and you must maintain yourself during that period. God, by definition, is a non-contingent being. In fact, Paul says, for by him all things were created. He wasn't created, and that is indicative of the fact that he wasn't created. Why? Because by him all things were created. Of course, a contingent being cannot create himself. He needs someone to create him. Both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and through him. Now let me ask you a question. When you see that word all up there, how much does that refer to? 90%? 95%? It refers to everything. Jesus Christ is the firstborn. The word there in the Greek language is arche. 
It's where we get our uh, English word, or our English word is derived from that architect. Architect. It's the one that designs something that gets the plans laid out. He creates what the, he doesn't build it necessarily, but he draws the plans. Jesus Christ has drawn up life. He is the designer. In fact, John the Apostle said this, All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Now, why is this important to this church? Because this church had gone sideways spiritually. This church had gotten off course. This church had become so influenced by their culture, so enmeshed in a personal peace and affluence that they had gone sideways from Jesus. Now the problem is most of us don't know when we're getting sideways because it takes so long. They're incremental steps. It doesn't happen all at once. This church was a church that God could not commend because they had gotten sideways because they had stopped listening to the truth, they had stopped listening to the revelation, and they had stopped looking to Jesus Christ for the design of life. And I will tell you, if you are not in the Word of God on a regular basis, and I would suggest daily, you are moving away from God. There is no way in the world that you can stay enmeshed in the truth without being in the truth. I often use the phrase that unless you are in the book and on your knees on a daily basis, you're going to start drifting away from Jesus. This church had totally drifted away from Jesus Christ. Therefore, he has some criticism. And the criticism that he levels at this church could be leveled at many churches in America today. Notice what he says, and we'll read his criticism. That's in verses 15 and 17. I know your deeds. Now, I must say that these weren't necessarily deeds. These were misdeeds or missed deeds. They weren't doing what they're supposed to. It wasn't a dynamic church. It had become static. And just like a church can become a static, you can become static. You just slowly stop doing what God's told you to do. You slowly but surely stop being serious and you become flippant about your Christian life. It is the most important thing. And I would tell you, I commend you all from being here. I know, and, and, and please, I, I know the temptation. I had the temptation. I want to stay home and see the Broncos play. I even wore an orange and blue shirt. But I will tell you, when one second into eternity, may I ask you a question, is it going to matter whether you saw the kickoff? Then why are you watching it? You could be at church with your brothers and sisters. And one second into eternity, that will have implications. This church didn't have good deeds. They had bad deeds. And Jesus is saying, I know your deeds. Notice what else he goes on to say. That you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm... And, have, and, and, and are neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. This church, although quite wealthy and quite endowed materially, was bankrupt spiritually. That is a problem with Christians in America. We have been given so much, and all of us enjoy so much, that it is easy for us to focus on the things of this world rather than the things of God. He says that if you do that, you will become a useless Christian or a useless church. Now, why am I using that? 
Well, notice what he says. He says in this passage, because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, this passage sometimes has been used, I believe wrongly to say, that you can lose your salvation unless you're on fire from God. In fact, I've heard people teach this passage, and they've said this, God would rather you be a cold-hearted pagan than a lukewarm Christian. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. That makes absolutely no sense. You mean God wants me to be a pagan. God wants me to go to hell rather than being a lukewarm Christian that goes unrewarded to heaven. Is that what you mean? And they get this kind of furrowed brow on their look, you know, and they, well, I I don't know if I'd put it that way. I said, how else would you put it? You see, the problem with saying that this passage teaches you can lose your salvation if you become kind of what I call a Goldilocks Christian, which is not, it's not too hot, not too cold. It is what? Never just right in this situation. But a Goldilocks Christian is still going to heaven. You see, the people that says he will spew you out of my mouth, I'm saying, so how does that reconcile with Hebrews 13, which says, I will never leave you, nor will I ever desert you? It seems to contradict Scripture. And Scripture never contradicts Scripture. The second thing I asked him, I said, well, it's lukewarm. I mean, what degree of temperature is that? I mean, you know, if you're kind of lukewarm at, say, maybe you're 100 degrees, do you get spewed out? Or can you stay in his mouth if you're 105 degrees? At what point do you get spit out? And no one can come up with what good works keep you in his mouth. No, he's not talking about that at all. You see, and I've got some pictures here from our trip. This is a picture. I think Randy took this one. This is a street in Laodicea. This is one of the streets that we walked down, and this was the main thoroughfare in Laodicea. One end of it takes you to the sea, one end takes you all the way back to Syria. It was the trade route, it was the main, it was the cardo, if you will. It's the main route through town. It's I-25. But the problem with this city is it had all this wealth, all the medical center, financial center, garment sector, had all that, but it didn't have a water supply. And that compromised the city. So they would have to get their water from another city. This is Heropolis. And if you look, you can kind of see the indentations from the wagon wheels, which would go through their main street, through their city. They had on that city in Heropolis, they had these hot springs that would gurgle and bubble out. Now that looks like you're getting ready to, when we looked at it, it looked like a ski area. I mean, it does look like that, but it's not. It's hard. It's calcium carbonate or something like that. And it, it's, it's the chemicals that are in the hot water that, that spews out from the ground. And you can fact, I mean, you know, my wife made me take pictures. There's no way I'm putting my feet where a thousand dirty people's feet have been. Millions of dirty feet have been. I am not getting in that water. I don't even get in hot tubs. Because I, never mind. Anyway, but the point I'm making there is that is what is in Heropolis. So what they would do, and here's a picture, this is from Ephesus, they would create conduits or aqueducts or pipes to bring that water, that hot water, that was their closest water supply. When it left Heropolis, it was very hot. When it got to uh, Laodicea, what do you think it was? Lukewarm. But it also contained the minerals. Now, there's nothing wrong with lukewarm water, although most of us would rack our water either hot or cold. If you're going to make a cup of tea in the morning, do you want lukewarm water? No, you want boiling water. If you've just come in from a run, do you want hot water? No, you want cold water. Most of us don't want lukewarm water. That's above room temperature. In other words, lukewarm water is useless to you. What Jesus is saying, not that these people were not Christians, but simply they were useless Christians. And there's a lot of Christians that way. If you're not in the book, on your knees, if you're not walking with Jesus Christ, you are becoming a useless Christian. 
This word is used several other times within Scripture. Luke 14, 34 through 35 says, Therefore salt is good, and it is. I love salt. I'm from the south. You need to salt everything. Ice cream needs salt. Therefore salt is good. But even salt has become, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? In other words, the idea is that the salt would, would because back then it would kind of be diluted, you wouldn't sit there and salt, salt, and then take that and salt your meat. It's, it's useless. It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus is saying, I don't need useless Christians. We also see, and John did such a superb job teaching Philemon, and that's what he's going to be teaching in the pastor and professor. But there's also this word is used in Philemon's the 11th chapter, who Philemon formerly was useless to you, but now is useful to you and me. You see, Philemon stole from his master. He became a Christian, and he's saying now he, where he was useless to you, he was someone that didn't do what you wanted him to do. Now he's very useful to the both of us. And then, of course, this word is used in James 2.20. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? It doesn't mean that your faith, that you're, you're not going to go to heaven. But it's saying, unless you are energizing your faith, and that's what works do, they energize your faith. Unless you are doing good works, your faith is useless to those people around you. If you read the context of James 2, and it says someone comes to you and they're hungry, hungry or they need clothing and you say be warm be filled be gone your faith is not helping them it needs to activate in good works doesn't save you but your faith will atrophy and die unless you've activated it by doing good works what was happening in Laodicea the same thing that will happen to you is unless you are actively doing what God wants you to do your faith is dying and you are becoming useless the repercussions of that and we shall see that in just a moment the reason they were useless is because they were clueless you see they thought that uh you, their, their, their philosophy of life was get all you can and can all you can get and poison the rest. As long as they had accumulated material wealth, as long as they had accumulated all that, they said, we don't have anything else. Notice the words that they say. Notice what they say in this passage. And it is something that a Christian should never say. Verse 17, because you say... Jesus is going to tell you what they say. Now, I think they said this. I don't think Jesus is lying. I think they went around saying this. They reveled in material wealth. He says, because you say. He's not making this up. This is what they said. Remember, Jesus Christ walks among the churches. In fact, Jesus Christ walks among us. And he hears what you're saying. Have you ever thought about that your words reflect your heart? Cynthia and I caught ourselves in that situation, or at least I did. She's much more, at least I did. She's much more spiritual than I. But we were running like crazy. We left the airport in Athens and our flight was delayed and we only had a, like, you know, an hour to switch international. And we had to reclaim our luggage and recheck our luggage. We're going, boy, howdy. I had low, no joy in my heart. I was grumbling. I, I can't believe the travel agent did it. Why would they ever think about doing that? And I'm sitting there saying, we're not going to make our flight. We're going to be stranded here in Athens. So my wife says, well, let's just pray about it. I said, I don't need that kind of advice. <laughs> so we prayed, dear God, we really want to meet that, that plane. We want to make it, and we'd like for our luggage to get there. And literally, we boarded the plane with five minutes left. 
And so I'm saying, there's no way our luggage is going to get there. So I get on the plane and start complaining about that. You're on the plane. Isn't that what you asked for? Why didn't you ask for your luggage to get there? I do something about that. No, but just get on the plane. Why are you on the plane? Stop your belly aching. Uh, I didn't hear the voice of God, but sometimes I hear, and it sounds like a five-foot-something petite blonde that's sitting here, you know. So anyway, we get on the plane. We get to, we, it was a crazy flight. We had to fly from uh, London Heathrow to L.A. We get to L.A. We go and wait for our luggage. Guess what's not there? I told you it wouldn't be here. Well, let's go find an agent. So we go find an agent. Oh, yep, she, we've got a list here. Your luggage is not here. Well, I didn't think it'd be here. And um, she said, but we can get it shipped to your, your, your final destination. I said, oh, okay, that's great. Yeah. And so anyway, they, 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 they were going to ship it. So we don't know when we're going to get our luggage. Joe, have you gotten your luggage yet? Very good. I'm glad you got yours. Um, so anyway, we had no idea when. No, we've got ours. I had no idea when the luggage was going to get there. And so anyway, we got on the plane and at least say, well, at least we get there. And my wife, she said, well, you know, the good news about this is we don't have to pay for the extra luggage charge with United. We're going to beat the man. <laughs> and she says, and I thought of another great idea. We don't have to schlep our luggage out of the airport. They'll bring it to our house. Yeah, I think so. So anyway, we get to DIA. We finally get to DIA, and our plane's delayed. And I think we got in almost 12 o'clock in the morning or something like that, or 12 o'clock at night. I don't know if that's morning or night. But anyway, so we, we get in there, and we don't have luggage. Not, we're, you know, we, first thing you do, you go to the bathroom after a flight. So we all stop, get to the bathroom. And uh, my phone, as soon as I touched down, started ringing. I ignored it. Then I'm waiting for Cynthia in the bathroom. Most husbands are used to that. But anyway, I'm waiting, you know. And I said, you know, I got a phone call. So I pulled it out. It's from unknown. I said, great, junk caller. But they left a message. Okay, fine. I'll look. It's United. They said, by the way, um, uh, um, uh, Isaac, my name, Isaac, first name. They said, Isaac, we have your, your luggage. We got your luggage from L.A., and there's a, a notation. We're supposed to send it back. Immediately, I got on the phone and called that number. I said, you have our luggage? Yes. Where is it? It's at Carousel B, number 14. Where? In Denver. Do you want us to send it back? No! We'll be right there! So my wife was wrong. We did have to slap our luggage out of the place, all right? But you see, they were useless because they were so clueless. And Christians can become clueless. We can drift right back into that. Clueless, what? Notice what they said about themselves. We are rich. We have become wealthy. And oh my goodness, never let this come out of your lips. We have need of nothing. We are rich. And notice they say, oh, and by the way, we did it. You see, their favorite song in Laodicea was Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. They love that song there. They always talk about, oh, yes, we did it. We had nothing, but we made all this money now. And by the way, we've got so much money. We don't need anything. These are Christians. That's what they said. They were actually saying that. But I want you to notice that they forgot what Jesus said. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me. And that the word abide means to feel at home, to be comfortable with. 
That means, you know, you go to somebody else's home and you don't abide there. You don't take off your shoes and your socks and put your feet up on the coffee table. You do that at your place, don't you? Because you abide there. You feel safe there. You feel comfortable there. Jesus is saying the one who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. What was the problem with these Laodiceans? No fruit. No fruit. He bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do how much? Nothing. You know what nothing is? Nothing is a zero with the sides kicked out. The Laodiceans thought all they needed was within themselves. There's so many people that are trying to live life today apart from Jesus Christ, apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from the Holy Word. We don't need it. Now, what did Jesus say about them? <laughs> this is tough. You look at this and you're saying, whoa, man, he just backed up the truck. Notice what he says. He says, um, and you do not know. See, I started to say, that's why I say they're clueless, but they were saints that were stupid. And you do not know that you are noticed five-fold tragedy. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and worst of all, naked. The greatest humiliation within this world was to have to walk around with not even a covering for your body. He says, you guys, you think you're rich? You're wearing those wonderful black robes, but you're naked. You're miserable. You're wretched. You're blind. And I would suggest to you that it's easy for any Christian to get in that condition. Have you seen pictures of people who have lived a life, and you know, most of the time it happens to be Hollywood stars. See what they look like in their 20s, and they look what they look like in their 50s. And you see what living a life apart from God leads to. You see, Jesus said, you are wretched, you are miserable, you are poor, you are blind, and worst of all, you're naked. But you're not hopeless. Even though they were useless and clueless, a Christian is never hopeless. And he gives two commands here. Notice his counsel, and this is the first time ever Jesus says, I advise you. Now, I remember uh, from the Watergate era, I'm that old, and remember um, uh, 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 Nixon was saying, well, what if we broke, what if we tried to cover this up? His attorney said, well, Mr. President, you're the president, you can do whatever you wish to, but I would not advise you doing that. Jesus is giving advice. Now, how many would like it? Wouldn't it be kind of cool? You got a problem, you get advice from God? How many would like that? Read it. Read it. It's here. Everything you need to know about growing spiritually, and that should be your first concern, not growing financially. Everything you need is in this book. And that's why he says to them, I'm going to give you some advice. I'm going to give you counsel. You need to do a little commerce with me. Notice what he says. He says three things here. He says, he says I'm going to give you advice to buy from me gold refined by fire. They needed true riches. 1 Peter 1, 7. Whoops, let's go back to that. Uh, 1 Peter, uh, whoops, still not there. There, there we go. Uh, his command, his counsel, they needed riches. 1 Peter 1, 7, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that you've gotten lazy in this church. Your faith is never on the line. It's not being tested. You need to get there and have your faith tested. Be in that situation where you have to depend on me. We were there. We, this was crazy. I mean, you, we don't have to depend on God in our country. We just call somebody that knows somebody. 
or we'll just stroke a check and solve it. When we were over there in this last trip, we got called out of a luncheon. It was myself, John, Cynthia, and I. We got called out of a luncheon. And Rhonda, who's in charge of the trip, said, uh, can you all come with me? Oh, man, I remember when I was in high school, I heard that phrase all the time. It was never good. We said, sure. So we walk up, not knowing. I mean, but she says, uh, we've got a problem. That's not good. When the per- She says, we've got a hurricane coming in. And that hurricane can strand us. If we go to Kos, another island there, it can strand us on Kos. Do we live Patmos? Do we go to the hurricane? I said, I believe that God wants us and everybody else agreed. We want to go. So let's just ask God to help us. And guess what? We made it. There's only one ship left. We got on the ship. And it got us there. It's amazing what happens when you pray. You can can worry just like the song said. Or you can pray and trust God to do something. And we came to the conclusion. We're going to ask for this. And if it doesn't happen, we're going to say, God, you know best. There's a reason you don't want us to continue the trip. See, that's where your faith becomes refined. Second thing is, they needed not only riches, but they needed raiment. They had these beautiful cloaks, but they needed something else. It says he, 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 he speaks there of this, not black garb, not this black thing, but he says, white garment so that you may clothe yourself. Why? Because you're naked. Now, Revelation 19.8 says, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. You see, not only do you need to do this, the way that you get the fine linen is activating, exercising, energizing your faith by doing good works. Third thing they needed is they had an eye problem. They couldn't see well, and he says, you need a remedy for that. And notice what he says, an eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. They're saying, wait a minute, everybody comes to our city for that eye salve. He says, no, you need a heavenly salve because you've got the wrong focus. That's what Jesus says in Matthew. It's supposed to be the eye is the lamp of your body, so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. There was so much darkness in these Christians. Because they didn't have a heavenly focus. He also goes on to say, and he says, hey, I'll make two commitments to you. The first is the commitment of communion. Notice what he says in 3.20. Or look in verse 19. I should have read that. Verse 19. Those whom I love... I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Notice he says, those whom I love. You mean, if you say these were not, Jesus even loves you at your worst possible day. Even in your greatest sin, you cannot escape. Jesus loves you. I don't care what you've done, how you've degraded yourself, how you've done, how much you've done. We were on the trip and we were talking. We had this great, it, was kind of a, it ended up a two-hour session at the table. It was just kind of pa- pester the pastor with questions. And so we're doing it and I said, you know, salvation's free. It's a gift. Once you get it, you can never lose it. If it's eternal life, if not it's temporal life, it's eternal life. And they said, well, I, I think you can if you deny Jesus Christ. I said, Really? Well, I tell you what, I'm going to give you some time to think about it. I'm not going to give you my answer. I'm going to give you some time to think. Could you maybe get your Bible and give me a book, chapter, and verse for that? He said, well, I don't know if I could find it in the Bible. I said, I said, okay. Well, then why do you believe? Well, I think, I said, sir, I do not mean to be disrespectful, but your problem is you're thinking and not reading the Scriptures. And we had a delightful time. It was a good time with him. But notice what Jesus says in verse 20. And it's the most misunderstand verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Now, let me ask you a quick question. How do you, and I got this from John. It's a great illustration. How do you spell into, real quick? How do you spell it? What is it? Wrong. It's I in space, T-O. Look at your text. 
Did it spell it I-N-T-O? How did it spell it? I-N space T-O. Do you see what he's saying? That if you will repent of your self-ishness, of your self-sufficiently, I will come in to your fellowship to have a meal with you. He's not coming into, I-N-T-O, our hearts. He's coming into our community to fellowship with us. Do you get the picture? Jesus is on the outside of the church of Laodicea. He's knocking. He's knocking on the door, asking them, would it be okay if I came in for a few minutes? I mean, think about this. Here, you know, Think if we were here today, and all of a sudden on our back door we are... Most of us, maybe some of us are, would think, what's that? Now, you're at home if you hear, what do you do? Well, if, if, it's, if it's a bill collector, you hide. But if it's not, what do you do? You go where? To the door. Let's say that finally, after about 10 minutes of hearing... Someone walks back to the door. And then they walk back up here and they can't whisper in my ear. They said, it's Jesus. <sighs> Did he see you? Well, no, I just peeked around the corner. Oh, good. Everybody be quiet. Jesus wants in here. That's what they were doing. Jesus is knocking and wanting to come in to fellowship with them because he loves them. And they're saying, oh my gosh, do not let him in. He's going to tell us things we don't want to hear. But you see, Jesus will never leave you content. He'll always knock, not only on a church, but an individual's heart to let them come in. But not only does he want to have communion with you, the final thing is he wants is what? He wants to compensate you. If you'll let him in. If you'll allow him to reign and rule in your heart, there's compensation. And he tells us what it is. What does he say there in the, the final portions of, um, this is so cool. My, my, my Bible's all, the pages are crinkly because uh, I was preaching. It started raining, so my Bible got wet. But anyway, he, what does he say here? He says this. He says, he who overcomes. And by the way, in uh, Ephesus, this is a picture of the goddess Nike, which is Nike or the goddess of victory. That's what this word is. He who overcomes, she's the overcomer. He who overcomes, that's not self-reliant. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, I don't think we're all going to be sitting on each other's laps. There's probably a, a big area and a big set. But let me ask you a question. Did you know that when you go in, and I learned this from watching all these critically acclaimed, historically accurate shows, Elizabeth, The Crown, Downton Abbey. I realized that when you walk in on the queen, you have to walk in on the queen and guess, and you bow. But then you do, how do you leave the throne room? Backwards. You never turn your back. Up. And I learned this too. I learned that Queen Elizabeth is kind of a pig, the way she ate. It's historically accurate, I'm sure. But you could not start eating until she took her first bite. And she was like one of my dogs inhales her food. <laughs> And maybe you had just taken one little bite, but when she puts her fork down, guess what? Your dinner's over. You don't eat anymore. But one thing you never do is pull up a stool and sit next to her. Do you understand what Jesus is promising to you if you overcome a seat at the table?
Jesus is knocking. What are you doing? You see, he is the only indispensable person in your life. He will always tell you the truth. He'll always love you. He is indispensable. How much time are you spending with him? Secondly, you are either a very useless Christian or you're useful. You're one or the other. When you get to heaven, the only words I want to hear are well done, good and faithful servant. I remember in seminary, I wasn't the brightest bulb in the box by any stretch. But I remember the first time I took my first Greek exam. I was scared to death. I was scared I'd failed. What a relief to know that I barely passed. See, when you get to heaven, are you going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? Are you clueless? Or are you clued in to what's important? What takes your time? What occupies your thoughts? Where is your money spent? Where is your time allotted to? The things of God or the things of this world? And if Jesus wants to have more of you, will you receive them or reject it? C.S. Lewis uses that wonderful phrase that, you know, God comes to us, you know, when we first become a Christian. And then all of a sudden, he says, he starts like renovating a house. He starts banging and clattering and moving furniture and opening new rooms out. And pretty soon, you know, it becomes uncomfortable. In fact, he goes on to say that many Christians, God is turning you into a masterpiece. But in order to do that, sometimes he'll put paint on and scrape paint off, put paint on, scrape it off, and it becomes very, very painful. He wants to make your life a masterpiece. Don't settle for a thumbnail sketch. And finally, is your life marked by convenience? Or conviction. I think all of us as we were at this Mars Hill. And we saw this little Jewish guy. That left everything familiar to him. And the convenient thing to say. These guys are all gone. They're wasted. Why even talk to them? He starts sharing the gospel. Because he was convinced. That Jesus Christ is the Lord God of the universe. He didn't live a convenient life. He led an obedient 